Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable, where we believe the best financial advice would always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom. Today is my co-host, Brad Lyons. Hey, Brad. Hi, Casey. Today's topic is withdrawal strategies for retirees. This sounds like, kind of like a boring topic to me, but honestly, it's a question that we get very often from uh, people planning for retirement. Uh, and it really comes down to they're looking at IRA, looking at Roth, looking at brokerage account money that's you know not inside an IRA or a Roth, different pensions and when to take the pension and when to take Social Security. There are all these things out there and they want to know in what order should I be withdrawing assets? And there's one answer that I think is very textbook. And then there maybe there's an answer that's really better for today. So let's go ahead and get started, Brad. What are some considerations we have to take to, into account before we can even really start the analysis? Well, you know, you brought up a good point that it, a lot of people are somewhat confused when it comes time to determining, you know, where to get their, their retirement income. Setting the considerations aside, I mean, when we're in our working years, we tend to have a single source of income. It's our earned income. It's from work. We go to work, we earn a paycheck, and that's the income that we have to spend for that, that time period. When we retire, by definition, that paycheck ends, and we have to create another source of income. And generally speaking, for most people, that source of income is multiple-oriented. We have, as you mentioned, IRAs, Social Security, pensions, brokerage accounts, etc. And determining the best manner in which to begin taking that income is really a very interesting topic. The more and more we get into it with clients and determining what is best for, for each of them. And some of the things that clients may not have even considered or if they had, they had no way to necessarily evaluate how to take these things into evaluation and consideration as they make their income streams possible. Something like longevity. We're living longer, which means our money has to last longer. Inflation. You know, we've been in a fairly low inflationary period here in the last 10 or 15 years, but historically it's not been that low. And we're talking, talking at a very long time, as we just mentioned in longevity. So we have to factor in inflation. We'll talk a little bit about that. In the textbooks, you'll hear about income re replacement ratios, which is a fancy word for your spending needs. How much do I need to get every month out of my income in order to meet my needs in, in retirement. And then there's something else, spending patterns in retirement are a little different uh, than they were in our working years. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that, but considering your spending pattern. And then of course, social security, there's you know literally hundreds of different methods that you can choose to take your social security, but once that's chosen, that's locked in. So that becomes a very important consideration. And we're going to go through each one of these, and I think they're all very interesting in and of themselves. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about longevity. You know, we plan for a person to live to age 95 without running out of money. You know, if they retire at 65, that's a 30-year period. That's a long time. That's an entire generation and a half, you know, to live. A man at age 65 today is expected to live another 19 years on average. That takes them out to 84, and they have a 25% chance of living to age 93. A woman at 65 is expected to live to 86 years with a 25% chance of living to 98 years old. And husband and wives, both at 65, have a 50% chance of at least one living to age 93 and a 25% chance of living to, one of them living to age 98. So longevity is a very big consideration in retirement income planning, and it has to be thought through at every level of income streams here. You know, we talked a little bit about inflation. As I mentioned, it's been rather tame for the last 15 years. You know, we use a 2.25% a rate of inflation uh, when we do our planning. And for, for those of you who, who know of the, the rule of 72, and for those of you who don't, what it's saying is that if you take any given interest rate and you divide it into the number 72, it gives back the number that, of years it takes for money to double when invested at that interest rate. So if you take 2.25% and divide it into 72, in 32 years, we're looking at the cost of everything that we buy being twice as high as it is today. And we're expecting to live 30 years on a planning sense. So we're looking at an increasing cost of living over a retirement period that will ultimately double 
from the price that it is today for a age, person age 65. I found that to be fascinating, Casey. Yeah, and I think if um, you're listening to this right now, you think, oh, 2.25% seems kind of low because we're talking about 6 to 10% inflation this year. I'll add that the inflation um, that we're looking at in our program is over a lifetime. And right now, uh, most reputable analysts believe that inflation is not going to be at 6% plus uh, going forward. It's just this is a recovery inflation just probably going to happen over a, a one-year cycle, and then it'll come back down. That's what Vanguard and State Street and BlackRock are all pointing to. Well, they're all using uh, and, the same term, and that's transitory that inflation is transitory, that it will move on from here. Yeah, um, correct. Once the supply chain, you know, gets back in order. That's right. And also, you know, we, we talked a little bit too, spending patterns change. What we see very often is people will spend more at the beginning of retirement and then less in the middle and then more at the end, typically for healthcare uh, reasons. And it makes total so, sense. I mean, after they retire, they, they, they go into a period of celebration and they, they travel and they go do things that they're, they've been pent up, that they've been wanting to do and see and, and go places and have experiences that during their working lives, they, they, they weren't necessarily to do because you know their, their jobs kept them from it. So it's not unusual when you think through it that spending goes up early in your retirement, settles back down later in your retirement, and then as you mentioned, goes back up at the end, mostly due to healthcare costs. So it's not an even spending pattern uh, or straight line by any means. Correct. You know, in determining your how much you need an in income, you know, and to support your lifestyle, you know, it's a matter of looking at, at, at what your costs are, what your expected costs in, in different categories are going to be, what your living costs are, what your health care costs are going to be, and so on. It's generally a little lower than your working years because there are certain things that you don't have to pay for. When you're retired, you're no longer paying for commuting to work. You're no longer paying into Social Security, for example. Hopefully, your your house is paid off. I know that's uh, something that we like to help guide our all of our clients to, and that is a paid-off home going into retirement. So your housing costs may be a little lower. Uh, so there are all sorts of reasons why uh, we may not need quite as much income in, in retirement. And, of course, one is that we're no longer saving for retirement like we were. We're in retirement. You know, that's very true. Uh, another thing that we should discuss too is Social Security. Uh, I think a lot of people by, by default think they need to take Social Security as soon, the day after they retire. That's not always in their best interest. Uh, for most people, it's best to wait to age 70. But there are circumstances like a, a case study we're going to do today where maybe that's not the best case uh, and something has to be calculated out. But when you take Social Security payments, that does change where you pull your money from at times as well. That's right. And it being a, a reliable source, it's, it's something that we utilize as a foundation for, for many retirement income plans. So let's talk about some tax smart withdrawal strategies in retirement. Managing a stream of income from multiple sources to minimize current and future taxes. And I think that's key because, again, this idea of longevity means that we're going to go through periods of higher taxes and lower taxes throughout you know the retirement period. And all that needs to be taken into consideration to some extent. As we mentioned, that you know the different types of income streams that we would consider for, for any client that, that may have these is Social Security, our retirement accounts. Some retirements are taxable in our traditional IRAs. Some are non-taxable, such as the Roth IRA. Our investment accounts, which tend to be taxable, where you're looking at dividend income and capital gains income. Rental income for people who may have rental houses and rental properties. They may have a pension if they're fortunate enough. And so that's pension income. And some people may have, have an annuity that they're receiving or expecting to receive income from. And several of these different sources of income have different taxation structures as well. I know that um, you know, dividend income and capital gain income are two different income tax structures. Rental income as passive income. Uh, some states tax Social Security and some states don't tax Social Security. So all these, you know, needs to be considered if you're looking at ways to minimize current and future taxes. So it, it, it kind of begs the question, you know, like managing our taxes in retirement requires us to know something about the tax structure. Now, we, we are in a progressive tax system, you know, it, with the federal IRS. And so we go through these different marginal tax brackets. So the higher the earnings or reportable income, the higher the tax rate. 
that is paid on that income. So what we're looking at is trying to manage our marginal tax brackets with the different sources of income depending upon how they're taxed. Social Security has a different tax structure in and of itself as well. 85% of your income is taxable, which means at least 15% of it is not taxed. And depending upon the rest of your income uh, amount, it may be even lower than, than that uh, in terms of the amount that's taxed. As I mentioned, dividends and capital gains have a unique tax structure. And that's something we look at very carefully as to whether or not we should take capital gains in any particular year or conversely, harvest any tax losses and in investments in any given year in order to allow us as portfolio managers to harvest gains on a tax favorable basis. And then of course, your retirement accounts. You know, the traditional IRA, oftentimes we see as contributory or IRA rollovers from 401ks and other def types of defined contribution retirement plans. Those are fully taxable upon withdrawal, but they can be deferred, I should say, up to age 72, where at that point in time, we're required to make minimum distributions. The Roth IRA, on the other hand, is tax-free and can be tax-free throughout our entire lifetime as well. So that's a consideration is should we take tax-free income when possible? So Casey, I think we've kind of run through some of the tax circumstances. We should look at an example. Now I should say that, that this example is not typical of any client, nor is it atypical of any client. It is simply an example to illustrate ways to take income from different sources in order to minimize taxes throughout that period. Let's kind of dive into that. Let's look at a husband and wife 65 years old, both, basically the same same birth date. They retired on December 31st of last year, and they need to plan their income out for retirement. So our husband was an engineer. He earned 125000 His wife was a nurse earning 85000 They had $210,000 in income prior to uh, retirement. The house is paid off. They're completely debt-free. Dave Ramsey would be proud. I'm proud of him. They have uh, two children two grandkids in another state. The mother's 92, lives alone, is doing well. We had to make it real, I guess. <laughs> it has well, no bearing unusual, on retirement. You know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, their income goal was to uh, pull down about $120,000 a year. They really need to live on about $100,000, but additional $20,000 could be used for some home improvements and some travel expenses uh, that would probably be recurring going forward. Husband is eligible for roughly $30,000 in social security immediately at age 65. Uh, now, if he delays to uh, age 70, that'll increase to about 39,000. Because, you know, if you delay social security each year, you get an 8% bump. His full retirement age or for both of them is 66 and four months based on their birth date. So if he takes social security right away, there's going to be a penalty. If he takes uh, social security, at his full retirement age, he'd get the 30,000. Wife is eligible for $27,000 immediately, uh, and it's raising to, uh, rising to $35,000 uh, by age 70. They have a million dollars in IRA, uh, or that's his IRA. She has $500,000 in her IRA. They both have $50,000 in each Roth and $250,000 in a brokerage account and $100,000 CD at the bank, which we really won't count toward retirement. We're going to use that as their emergency fund. Uh, when that CD matures. So looking at this scenario, million dollars in one IRA, half a million another, $100,000 in Roth, plus they've got the $250,000 in, in just a regular brokerage account. If you sell it, they pay some capital gains, but no income tax. So looking at this scenario, a standard withdrawal strategy for anyone out there without any special circumstances or any other objectives other than low tax is you pull money first from your non-qualified money. That'd be your brokerage account. You pay some capital gains tax, or maybe not. Maybe it could be at 0% based on your overall income. Then you're going to pull money from a Roth IRA next because it is uh, tax-free. And then you would go to an IRA to withdraw and pay income tax there. Kind of allows the IRA to keep growing. So it helps pay for its own tax through its growth, I guess, is one way to look at that. So in this case, we don't want to take a retirement penalty. We don't want to take less Social Security. What we would do is delay Social Security until full retirement age. So 66 and four months, we would take Social Security. In the meantime, they'd be living on that $250,000 brokerage account. 
and maybe a little bit of that CD, but we don't want savings to drop below $50,000. Basically, we're going to run through a $250,000 brokerage account. There's going to be some growth there, hopefully. So hopefully we're not depleting $120,000 exactly, but we're prepared to do that. There wouldn't be any tax paid because they don't have any income that year. So any capital gains tax most likely would be 0% in today's environment. Uh, and then after year one, they would begin taking Social Security, and they would continue to spend down that brokerage account with the difference until they got to basically zero there. And they would transition to the Roth IRA, and then they would transition over time to the IRA and start paying income tax. At age 72, you have to pull out a required minimum distribution anyway. So they would be living on that RMD and, and probably pull, obviously pulling out extra uh, along the way. Our $120,000 need, we're increasing that every year at 2.25% to help them keep up with the cost of living. That's an example of the most tax efficient strategy to withdraw from. There is another scenario here, we'll call it option B, and that is looking out in the future, we're not confident that tax rates are going to remain low. So there might be some opportunity here to defer money for the future tax-free and also take care of some estate planning. One of the issues we have in estate planning right now is that $1.5 million in their IRAs, when their kids inherit that money, they have to pull that money out over 10 years. They can't stretch that out over their kid's lifetime. Another option, if you have time available and in the lower income bracket available to you is to convert some of those IRAs into Roths. So it grows tax-free. Now you can't convert the whole thing, obviously, but there might be an arbitrage here on the tax code. For example, Brad, you mentioned it earlier, the tax code is progressive. So the first $20,000 that you earn as a couple is taxed at 10%. The next 20 to $81,000 that you earn is only taxed at 12 so in that first year, they don't have any income. We're pulling money out from that brokerage account. They could pull out $81,000 and convert it to a Roth IRA and only pay 12% tax. Never in their lifetime are they going to have an opportunity to uh, have a, that low of a tax bracket. Because now, once, if they want once to get it's more pulled aggressive out and goes into it, the Roth and it gets reinvested, it grows tax deferred. So you make that that's up right. over time. Well, no, it no, it grows tax-free. Well, that's correct. I stand corrected. <laughs> tax-free, that's right. If they want to get more aggressive with it, they could go to the 22% bracket and convert $172,000 from IRA to Roth. And they would only pay 22% on the top end. Their effective rate probably only be around 18% or so. But if they did that, they could convert $172,000 of their IRAs to Roth to grow tax-free into the future. So they do that in year one. Year two, they're getting social security. So it's harder to convert at that point because in their case, they're going to have roughly $57,000 in social security. They can convert up to, well, they could go up to the 172 again. They just subtract $57,000 from that. So maybe about $120,000, they can still convert and pay that higher 22% on. If they wanted to stick to that 12% bracket, then you know they could convert uh, maybe what, 12, 12 to $15,000 still at a 12% bracket. So they have a great opportunity to convert really all the way up between 65 and age 72 when the RMDs start kicking in for the IRAs. This is kind of, uh, it's not, hey, how do I convert to pay the least amount of tax? It's how do I convert and pay the least amount of tax over my lifetime? Does that make sense? Yeah, because one of our objectives was to minimize taxes in the current sense and the future sense as well. So we're looking yeah. at an entire 30-year period you know, of, of paying taxes in an efficient manner. And, and it really, there's even a, a version C of this, and that's where you assume that you're going to live to age 90, and you assume that tax rates are going to continue to get higher, then you would convert as much as you could now over the next few years prior to 72, because you believe that you will be in a higher bracket because of politics or because of maybe other, other income that might be coming in. You could be inheriting something in the future that's spitting off income that's 
that's hard to uh, sell for some particular reason. That's usually not a case. That'd be a very rare scenario. I would go back to say it's really hard to give specific vi- advice on a podcast to thousands of listeners uh, because honestly, each one's a little bit unique. But the important thing is, is you go through the right factors in determining it and look, uh, look at the big picture. And thank goodness, Brad, we have software that helps us with this. <laughs> it, this would be terrible to manually calculate this for every single family. Well, that's right. You know, the software helps to clarify, you know, the, the, the situation. And that's the, kind of the science and the art is what you were sharing with us just a moment ago, is that there are different scenarios that can be chosen and based upon the unique circumstance that we all find ourselves in. I mean, one of the other considerations is just simply, you know, uh, tax bracket creep, I'll call it. I mean, we're looking at just 2.25% inflation. Well, if the assets grow at least that, we're talking about twice as much, and we're, which means we're talk, looking at twice as much income in the future, which means we're going to be in a higher tax bracket in the future. So if all things are just left the same, other than inflation, we'd automatically be in a higher tax bracket in the future. So it makes sense to utilize the lower marginal tax brackets in the present in order to reduce our tax liability in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So again, you end up with multiple sources of income in our example. But what I see sometimes is as a retiree that has everything inside an IRA. And this tends to be a traditional, traditionally tends to be a, a, an older person uh, simply because maybe your Roth weren't available for a very long time period, or they didn't fully understand the benefits of the Roth. I will add that if you're listening to the podcast, you're way under retirement age. You really need to create two or three. If you can do three buckets, that's even better. But two buckets are very simple. In your most 401ks, they offer a Roth 401k option. So let's put 50% of your money in the pre-tax. So you're saving now on your tax return. And let's put 50% in the post-tax so that you're able to create a whole bucket for retirement that is tax-free. It helps with your estate planning in the future. It helps with income options in the future. If you're in an environment where it's very high tax, you can pull a little bit from the traditional IRA in that case, and a little bit from a Roth, where if you have everything taxable, you're kind of floating with the winds of politics and and, and what the tax rates are, are at. Well, by doing some pre-retirement planning, as you're suggesting here, it gives you the opportunity to have a more flexible income stream. The only thing we know about the future is is that it's going to change. And you have to be able to adapt to that change going forward. And by having multiple sources of income that are taxed at different rates or some that are not taxed at all, gives you that opportunity to switch from one to another or blending them together in order to have a maximum income with minimum income tax ramifications. Yes, and then also to um, our business owner clients, you know, you sell you sell that business, you liquidate that business, you really have no income, but you still probably have an IRA or an old 401k that's left over. You really ought to consider converting that to a Roth. And I think that's a missed opportunity that a lot of people aren't taking. If you could pay 12% tax, just slowly convert that IRA to a Roth over time is a very big uh, missed opportunity. Also, if you don't have an IRA, so meaning that you don't have an IRA to convert, you're maxing out your 401k and you want to save an additional money, uh, additional funds, you can do this by contributing to an IRA, not tax deductible, it'd be after tax, and then immediately converting that into a Roth IRA. That's the backdoor Roth. So if you have no income, why wouldn't you be converting, putting the maximum into you and your spouse's Roth every single year? Do a backdoor Roth so you're, can, you're building up uh, and it's a bit of, obviously it's a little bit of a shell game and you, you may even need the assets. You don't think they're that important. The important part is that you're growing tax-free money for the future to pull from. And it also helps with estate planning, obviously very long-term, but that's another strategy that if you're pre-retiree that you can be looking at as, and saving for your future. You know, the Roth IRA is really one of the most underrated retirement planning vehicles that, that exists. It just seems like e- each year, Uh, we find more and more ways to utilize a Roth in retirement planning than than we had in the in the past and it just doesn't seem to be as generally widely accepted as the traditional IRA was accepted when it was first came out 
uh, which is a shame because the benefits of the Roth, although are not immediate because you don't get the tax deduction when you make the contribution, they're longer lasting throughout the years of accumulation and, and payout. So just a plug for the Roth and that it's a very underrated and underutilized tax strategy. Great conversation, Brad. I hope it's beneficial to the listeners. And certainly if you have questions, you want to reach out to us, feel free to do that. We don't have to work with clients by managing assets directly. Like so many firms, we do offer hourly service where we can sit down with you and review such things uh, on an hourly basis. And uh, you're free then to go back and invest um, how you wish. But uh, if you just need some guidance and planning, uh, we're available to do that. Uh, Great conversation, Brad. I'll talk to you next time. Sounds great. Thanks for listening to the Wiser Roundtable podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss out on new episodes. Head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out if you have any questions. We would love to hear from you. Today's episode was produced and edited by Lilton Moore. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.